Imagine, you're 18, finally graduating high school after what seems like an eternity of years. You have a big smile on your face, all the time in the world, and a whole life ahead of you. Then suddenly, you blink, and you're 40, wondering where all those years went, and how they passed you by so quickly. Realize that life goes fast, it's hard to make the good things last. Sings Wayne Coyne in Do You Realize, of a Flaming Lips 2002 album, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, urging us to value whatever precious time given to us on this strange journey we call life. This hopeful invitation to make the most of every moment is a major theme of Yoshimi, contrasting what's otherwise seen as a rather sad, melancholic record about mortality and the struggles of life all while dressed up as a fantastical science fiction tale about a tiny Japanese girl fighting huge pink robots. Symbolizing? Well, stick around. In this video, we'll take a closer look at the visionary Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, its meaning, how it stayed relevant, if it's really a concept album, and most importantly, what the hell are those robots? Welcome, the cool, the crazy, the fabulous, Flaming Lips! 1995. This is the year psychedelic alt-rockers Flaming Lips found unexpected mainstream success, culminating in what they surely to this day still consider their creative peak. A guest spot on Beverly Hills 90210. Jokes aside, the Lips didn't just come out of nowhere. By this point, they had already been a band for 10 years, released 6 albums and toured the country numerous times, and their story really is one of hard work, perseverance and love of music, uniquely American and deserving all the credit. Let's rewind the tape. Mid to late 70s, a glorious time full of conceptual prog and virtuoso musicians with delusions of grandeur. The rock stars? More or less gods. In Oklahoma City, future Lips frontman Wayne Coyne dreams of becoming a musician while full of self-doubt. Little did he know, it was all about to change. I always wanted to be in a band, but I could never figure out how. I saw The Who and was like, wow, how'd you get to do that for a living? F it wasn't until we saw the hardcore shows that we figured out how to do it. We'd say to ourselves, these guys pulled up in a van, we could do that. These guys have little amps, same sort of amps we have at the house. They just do it all themselves. And we talked to them and said, how do you guys make records? And they said, saved up money and did it. And we'd go, oh, I see, we could do that. Lit up by the spirit of punk rock and bands such as Black Flag, The Minutemen and The Replacements, The Lips formed in 83, put out their first record in 86 and started chasing the dream for real. They maintained this DIY rock and roll lifestyle for several years, refining their sound from a kind of noisy indie rock into more alternative psychedelic. In the early 90s, yet another revolution happened. Thanks to the massive impact of grunge, major labels suddenly opened up to sign alternative acts left and right, all hoping to score the next Nirvana. Warner picked up the lips, and in 94 they finally got their first hit with She Don't Use Jelly. An alternative Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, if you will. Its quirky, creative lyrics depict women putting Vaseline on toast and dyeing their hair with tangerines. But what really gets the blood flowing is that gobsmacking fuzzy riff. So unmistakably 90s, the flaming lips had finally broken in to the mainstream. <laughs> They've been called one of the most ambitious, imaginative and twisted bands in rock and roll today. And that's not an understatement. The wacky world of the Flaming Lips is apparent just by taking a quick look at their live shows. Like some bizarre psychedelic trip, they include everything from copious amounts of confetti to balloons, unicorns, 
fake blood, Christmas lights and pretty much everything else under the sun. In the early 2000s, the band also started inviting the audience to join them on stage, dressed in brightly colored animal costumes and this inclusion of furry fans is now given at every show. Now, this might lead you to believe that the Flaming Lips are just a bunch of goofy surrealists, not taking anything seriously. That's not really the case. The lyrics often have a deep sense of melancholy and weight to them. Look no further than the cathartic Waiting for a Superman about finding superhuman strength within yourself during heavy times, or feeling you disintegrate about impermanence and the shortness of life. A recurring theme in Coin's songwriting, as we'll see. It's this contrast of the happy and sad that, in my opinion, makes them such a fascinating band. And perhaps none of the albums displays this joyful melancholy better than Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, a record that's equally uplifting as it is somber. Not a lot of bands can say that they made their masterpiece, as well as the most commercially successful album, 20 years into their career, but somehow the Flaming Lips pulled it off. Drawing on the recent influence of underground electronic music bubbling up to the mainstream, while also embracing new digital recording technology, Yoshimi Bell's The Pink Robots marked a significant change for the lips. The album's sound can more or less be described as orchestral pop rock over electronic beats, and it's made up of a wide array of trippy sound effects, drum machines, and overall experimentation. <laughs> Though Coin has more or less denied it being a concept album, a big part of Yoshimi's mystique is that many fans still regard it as such. Key member Steven Drost explained, You could say like Rushes 2112, where the first side is just this suite of songs that all tie in together about man's struggle against the progression of technology. The second side is just a bunch of songs not related at all. And I kinda look at our record like that. The first five songs, there's a theme there, especially when you have Yoshimi part 1 and part 2. You can see how it all ties in together. But really, it doesn't bother me if people want to call it a concept record and get more meaning from it. That's fine with me. However you see it, there are undeniably some consistent themes throughout Yoshimi. From beginning to end, the album also takes the listener on a cosmic journey, not unlike, say, Dark Side of the Moon, the mother of concept albums. So yeah, conceptual or not, you decide. But what's actually the concept we're talking about here? Coin fills us in. We had this weird instrumental that didn't have a name, but we had invited Yoshimi from the boredoms to scream on it. And since it sounded like a fight was going on, I thought that was a great title. Yoshimi battles the pink robots. It's psychedelic, and that suited me fine. At the same time, Steven had this nice melody, just this unrelated thing that we were working on. And I started singing this ridiculous story. Oh Yoshimi, they don't believe me. But you won't let those. And the band took it from there, developing a narrative mostly apparent on the two titular tracks. Part 1 depicts the Yoshimi character as this disciplined martial arts expert contracted to save humanity from evil natured robots, while the chaotic part 2 supposedly represents the actual battle. <laughs> Track 2, One More Robot, also ties into this narrative, telling the story of Unit 3021, who learns to be more than a machine. Though not evident in the lyrics, Coin argues that the robot feels affection for Yoshimi, and while she admires the machine, it's her job to fight it, so she does. The robot then proceeds to self-destruct out of love for her. And perhaps this says more about humanity than it does the actual machines, since we are the ones who built them and passed down our behavior. The remainder of the album continues to explore these deeper existential themes of what it actually means to be human. The first track, Fight Test, sets the stage perfectly with Coin exploring the ambivalence of whether to flee from problems, 
challenges, robots, or face them head on. Ego tripping at the gates of hell and all we have is now share a common message of making the most of every moment. The latter again falling back on the science fiction aesthetic by weaving this moral into a story about a time traveler. Japan, apart from being the backdrop to Yoshimi's narrative, played a deeper role in the creation of track 8, It's Summertime. Coin explains how the lyrics came from an encounter on tour with two Japanese fans, one of whom suddenly died shortly after the band returned home. A friend of ours, Japanese, another Japanese element here, a Japanese friend, girl that we knew, had suddenly become ill and died. And, um, we had just seen this woman and she was fine. We'd spent a lot, quite a bit of time with her. We were really under the impression that she was fine. So just, you know, uh, I came up with this song. You know, it's me saying, you know, even though you're sad, in the same way that I was sad when, when my father died, that this idea of going outside and experiencing things and have experiences come into your mind, as opposed to sometimes when people are so sad and perhaps suicidal. It's things that are inside their mind just regenerate themselves. These aren't real experiences. The idea that you need to have experiences to start to mix in with your inner experiences is really what this, the sentiment of the song is. I'm not saying that it'll, it'll, it'll make you feel genuinely better, but it'll mix in there hopefully enough to elevate you out of this despair or whatever it is that you're feeling. And I think with all the arrangement, it sort of ends up going, you get this little bird chirping away, it feels like a springtime, like a summer day, and yet it's sad, it's still, it's still an encouraging sort of song. So here it goes. This theme of mortality is then amplified tenfold in the following track, Do You Realize, the album's climax and the lip's ultimate hymn of life. It especially got attention for the very blunt line, Do you realize that everyone you know someday will die? A line that, sung by any other band, might come off as cliché or melodramatic. But like we saw earlier, as a contrast to the joyful nature of the flaming lips, their humor and sheer optimism, it just works perfectly. Anyway, the fact that we're all going to die might seem like a terrifying notion, and many people do indeed regard it as a very sad song. But as Coin cosmically ponders in the line about the illusion of the sun setting, it's all about perspective. Yes, our inevitable demise is a brutal, but at the same time very straightforward reality. So rather than viewing it as something morose, why not see it as a wake-up call to actually start living? Instead of saying all of our goodbyes, come out of our robotic shells of everyday existence, let the people around us know we love them and appreciate the subtle beauties of life. Just the simple fact that we're even here alive, floating in space, is something so unbelievably strange and unlikely that we really ought to treasure every little minute of it. So what's actually the meaning of Yoshimi Bell's The Pink Robots? Well, ever since its release, fans have pondered the nature of the robots and what they represent, suggesting everything from depression to child labor, love, drugs, and even PMS. But perhaps the most unanimous interpretation is that they symbolize cancer, possibly breast cancer on account of them being pink. This angle was also explored further when the album, believe it or not, was adapted into a Broadway musical back in 2012. The world has changed a lot in a decade though, and by now it's probably already crossed your mind, Unit 3021 being sentient and all. Is Yoshimi fighting to protect humanity against the malevolent force of AI? Maybe. The reality is, no one knows. But that's really what's so amazing about music. It can take on a myriad of meanings. For me, the robots might be a schoolyard bully, while for others they're a disease or some other challenge or hardship. Based on our own experiences, we all take part in and help shape Yoshimi's story. And that, my friends, is a strong indicator of excellent storytelling. Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots is a concept so bizarre, so wacky, that really it shouldn't work. And I think, in the hands of any other band, it would have failed miserably. 
I read one review saying that the albums like The Powerpuff Girls filtered through the twin lenses of anime and science fiction, which I think pretty much perfectly sums up the fantastical world of Yoshimi. It's fun, brightly colored, light-hearted, happy and sad, vividly textured and psychedelic, with deep emotional weight. And as with kids shows, it also teaches important morals. For instance, be brave enough to stand up and fight, even against impossible odds, love the ones around you, and make the most of every single fleeting moment, because we never know when it'll be our last. Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots was released in July of 2002, and while undeniably an artistic triumph, it also had a huge commercial appeal. It managed to catapult the Flaming Lips back into the mainstream, being certified gold in the United States and awarded a Grammy for Best Rock Instrumental. Do you realize we're going to be featured in everything from commercials to Hollywood blockbusters and was even designated the official state rock song of Oklahoma in 2009? What moved the band more than anything though was that people everywhere adopted the song as their own, playing it during the heaviest but also the most joyous of times. Again, this happy, sad nature of the Flaming Lips is truly something remarkable. More than 20 years since its release, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots has stood the test of time, and today, in our increasingly hectic, technological world, the morals of believing in yourself standing up against whatever obstacle and seizing the day are more relevant than ever. Considering this profound, universal message, do you realize why it's become the Flaming Lips' most popular album and, in my opinion, their definitive masterpiece? Breakdown.